You are listening to the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network. You're listening to the Horror Ramblings Podcast, the show about all things horror. (laughs) We hope you enjoy the show. Ah, this is the Horror Ramblings Podcast, the show about all things horror. I am your host, Lester Blosser, joined by my co-host and good friend, the extremely talented Stephen White. How are you today, Stephen? I'm doing all right, sir. How are you? Can't complain. It's another cold day here in Ohio, but you know, that happens. Yeah, it's uh, cold here as well. The temperatures can't seem to make up their mind what they want to do, even though we're in springtime. It's 70 one day and 30 the next. Yeah, you know, I think Mother Nature might be in a bad mood or something. Perhaps. But, you know. well, we don't want to. We don't want to assume. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to scorn a woman like Mother Nature. But <clears throat> before we uh, get into the actual show, I want to first give you a shout out because this podcast is going to find its home on your production site, pencilpaperproductions.com which Mm -hmm. for all the listeners out there, I just have to tell them if they get the chance to check out your website, they should. You have several series on there and you have several podcasts on there. Your main podcast being Super Mega Crash Bros Turbo. And Mm -hmm. I could talk about your podcast because I've listened to it, but you've got over 200 episodes, so I haven't gotten through all of them, needless to say. Um, So I want to take a minute and uh, have you talk about your podcast a little bit. I want you to... You know, give the listeners an idea of what it's about, because I think that they would really appreciate what you do. So the floor is yours. All right. Well, as he said, I do have another podcast called Super Mega Crash Brothers Turbo. It's a mouthful. But once you get to say it a couple of times, it's so much easier, as you can simply tell. 200 episodes, it just rolls off the tongue. Uh, It is a different podcast than what we have here. This is a horror podcast, so we want our horror fans to be here for this. But if you're a gamer... If you're a gamer and you want a little gaming news, you can come over and check out Super Mega Crash Brothers Turbo. And we talk about uh, the week's news in the gaming industry. We talk about uh, any new releases coming out, sometimes review things. Sometimes we look back on events or games that we loved uh, way back when. We did, I think at the end of last year, I did a five-part series on the uh, creation of the ESRB and everything that kind of went along with that. Funny enough, I saw an article pop up on Twitter the other day that was that exact story. It was like someone's headline. It was like, hey, did you happen to know that Mortal Kombat uh, was responsible for the ESRB and E3? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I just talked about that on my podcast a couple of months ago. So (laughs) everybody's got the same story. You know, I guess we could all rehash it. But uh, you can find it on all your major platforms. It's it's everywhere in the podcast world. So Super Mega Crash hashtags on Twitter, Instagrams, and all that. You could probably find it, stumble upon it, links. And then, of course, at PencilPaperProductions.com slash Super Mega Crash. Now, I will say, too, um, speaking of, you know, that being a gamer podcast, I, I just listened to your latest episode. You actually did talk about uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. You talked mm-hmm, about the movie. Mm-hmm. And... Honestly, I think um, with with this podcast, we could even do uh, some horror games and things like that. I think that would be an interesting angle to take. But For sure. I, d- I do appreciate you uh, taking a chance and putting me on to your site and everything. That is a big step, and hopefully we uh, you know have a really good relationship with the fans out there and get something special going on. But we won't delay anymore. Let's go ahead and uh, get into the main guts of what the show is today. Um I thought we would start out with something real basic, just to give the listeners an idea of who we are. And what is more basic than saying, what is it that got each of us to love horror? And where do we want to see that genre kind of go? Um, If if you would like to start, you can, or I can start. It's whatever you are more comfortable with. Well, uh, I guess I could kick things off. Uh, Trying to think about how to answer this question was a little difficult because I kind of feel like horror's kind of always been there, but I know it was never something I was initially drawn to. It's almost like a fascination at a young age, but I'm not sure what that 
that one thing was that said, oh, man, I've got to get into that. <laughs> I would probably attribute some of that to my mother mm -hmm. because she was um, she was big into Stephen King. Yeah. And I, or at least, I don't know if she still is. I doubt it. <laughs> but I know at the time uh, when I was a child, I would see Stephen King books, you know, laying around the house. I know she liked watching some movies. Um, Twilight Zone, Tales from the Dark Side. And I know Twilight Zone reruns mm -hmm. back in, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, but Twi Tales from the Dark Side, I know, was uh, an 80s uh, show that, that popped up. and So it was always kind of there. So I guess I had a fascination with it from a distance, watching her enjoy it. And I was like, huh, I wonder what, what all this is. My first foray into horror that I can honestly, truly have a vivid memory of is I wanted to see Jaws. Yeah. Okay. Sh big shark movie. Hey, why not? And I, I feel that, that my introduction there, or at least my desire to want to watch that, is I saw a trailer for Jaws 2 on television. Like they were premiering it. ABC was going to be showing it or something like that. And I was like, killer shark movies? And this is a part two? My God, I, I, I want to see, I want to see this. I didn't. I never watched it on the television, just to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I I never saw that airing for some reason. But seeing that trailer, seeing what it was, I was like, oh man, I want to see this other movie. So I want to see the first one. So went out and rented it. Got through the entire movie up until Quint died. Yeah. And surely I I shouldn't have to say spoiler alert for all you horror fans out there at this point. <laughs> this is this is a go to film anybody this should be starter material for anybody wanting to get into films just saying uh but the moment that scene happened the intensity ramped up and my child brain was not in it wasn't prepared for that because that was just a, a step too far than where i had gone at that point so i had to run out of the room and kind of catch a breath and uh also regurgitate into the uh toilet in the bathroom because it was just it was too intense for a child. Can I ask you something? Sure. How, how old were you when you watched that? Do you remember? Uh, probably about five or six. Because I just, I know it was really, really early. I, I, I was not that old. I could have been older, but not by much. Yeah. I was fairly, like I had not done a whole lot in the horror uh, viewing yet. Funny enough, funny enough though, is even thinking about this now, I don't know which came first. So it could have been... It doesn't make any sense, though. <laughs> Maybe it was just the way it was shot. Maybe Spielberg was just that good, and he just got the intensity out of me. But at the same time now, keep this in mind, and I feel like it had to be prior to that. It's It's been so long. Think about this, people. It's been almost 40 years. Just keep that in mind. I know for a fact that at a babysitter we had around age four, five, six, she had a tape of Friday the 13th Part 5 that we watched almost every day in between um, He-Man cartoons, Voltron or whatever. But that, that was on rotation. I remember watching that movie so many times, which is why I don't really have a bad bias about it. I know people are like, well, don't chase it in the movie. I was like, I love it. Because, <laughs> you know, I've got such fond memories from childhood. Yeah. But I shouldn't have been watching it at five years old. <laughs> You know, just saying. Well, you know. <laughs> but I mean, but there was horror. I mean, it wasn't like super gory. And maybe that's what a lot of it kind of boils down to is maybe I didn't see the gore like I did there. Yeah. It was just an intense scene. You know, Quint dying was, I mean, everything just got ramped up. Oh, even to, and, even today, that's a brutal scene. Yeah, it is because it's, it's not really about the gore. It's just the tension in the moment. Yeah. Like, you know, he's going to die. The shark's sitting there swinging him around trying to kill him. It wasn't just like a quick you know death i mean it, it, it gets, was like no I'm, it gets your adrenaline up it really does yeah so i'm th I'm thinking that's probably what attributed to that moment because i had the same moment uh sometime after because nightmare on elm street i'm gonna uh, admit to that as well the very first time i watched that and i was accustomed i like i knew freddie freddie was like the big rock star at the time yeah. you know and it was like oh man everybody's talking about freddie so I was like well i want to see a freddie movie so i i got or rented A Nightmare on Elm Street, got to the scene with Tina, and it was just, like, I had to turn it off because it was like, oh, man, now I didn't throw up. But 
it was just the intensity was just there. I was like, oh man, what is going on? Like I didn't know if I could go a step further. And on a side note, just real quick, I have to say this: the thing that gets me with the movies from like the eighties and everything, especially mm -hmm. Nightmare on Elm Street, that scene with Tina, when you realize all the practicality that went into that it makes you appreciate yeah. it even more and there's so much that they try to just take and do computer effects for now that if they did practical effects it would just make your stomach turn over you know mm -hmm. I, I just had to say that real quick though but please continue but no <laughs> it, it does it does kind of lend itself to i don't want to just say credible because look cg effects they have their place uh i'm not saying that you can't do that, but there is something to the practicality of it. I mean, you take a look at everything that Tom Savini, K and B have done. It's there's just something more visceral about it when you feel like you can touch it, when you can see it. Yeah. And if everything is just digital and you can tell it's digital, because let's face it, what horror movie has the budget for super realistic digital effects. And, I mean, it, the, the thing that I've noticed, too, over the last, I would say, maybe 10 years, they've mm -hmm. they've started to do a, a really decent job at balancing out practical effects and CGI. And when you mix the two yeah. together, it is just next level. It really is. And, I, and I've always heard that argument, and I, I would have to agree, when you use one tool to improve the other, I mean, it, it's like a, a perfect marriage. Because you have something tangible, something you can touch, but then you're using that CG to just kind of enhance it even further. Mm -hmm. Like anything that you can't practically do, you use that and just tweak it. And it just, it makes it look so much better. You start to question it. And I, I have a, a profound respect for that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely in the camp um, practicality yeah. than CGI. But I, you know, I can appreciate a good CG thing if done correctly yeah but um now i mean those those would kind of be my early horror introductions and then at some point i guess i just built a stomach for it yeah so once i was able to handle watching these movies because i did go back to them pet cemetery was another one of those early ones in that one scene where gabe cuts the achilles tendon uh, is just even today i just I can't deal with it uh. i can't deal with that Ooh. But those were early things that happened, and it just made me go, oh, I don't know if I want to watch this. Oh, my God. But then when you're introduced to something more, because I saw the Johnny Depp uh, bed scene from Nightmare on Elm Street after that, that moment, mm -hmm. but this wasn't like immediately after. It was like some time after. And when I saw that, I was like, huh. I mean, I get that that's supposed to be gross, but I was just more fascinated with it than I was disgusted by it. Yeah, there, there's, so, there's like a weird fascination it's, it's kind of like when they say that you know when there's a car crash on the side of the road yeah. it, it you don't want to look but you can't help yourself yeah, you're just like oh, yeah I, I have to say this real quick before you continue but talking about scenes that are really disturbing there's one movie scene that still gets me to this day the the achilles heel scene that gets me still from pet cemetery but one scene mm. that always gets me and i don't know why in the original texas chainsaw massacre when he slams that girl up on the meat hook yeah. it is just so surreal in that moment and you're just watching it and every time i watch it i just cringe even to this day love the movie though it's it's one of those scenes that i honestly feel people think they're seeing something that's not there mm -hmm. and it's because it's so vicious and visceral in the moment that you think you just saw her get you know hooked yeah. on it from the like you saw the gore yeah and there's not a bit of it but it's the idea of it in your head that you're just sitting there going oh my god i just you 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 visualize it, yeah. and I think that's what makes it so perfect. Yeah, how they they edited that, shot that, and that that's an entire entirely different podcast right there. Oh we yeah, talk about Texas Chainsaw Massacre all day. Oh yeah, well, and honestly, but we'll get to that. You know, all, all those movies in the eighties, they went off of the idea that less was more. Yeah, you know, if you leave some mystery or you do scenes in a certain way, I remember in the original um, Nightmare on Elm Street when Freddy stretches through the wall, they. Mm -hmm. um, they actually just had a like sheet of stretchy material on the wall, and they just did the lighting a certain way, and he just pushed his face through. And to this day, that effect still holds up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you, you yeah, can't it's... CGI that. They tried that, and that's a whole other podcast too. But <laughs> <laughs> they tried it, and it did not work very well. <laughs> right. So I really don't know what more I can say about my my introductions into this. It was just something I I think it really came down to fascination. 
at some point, like I had been fascinated with it. I had to push through some of those, you know, early moments mm-hmm. that just kind of like caught me off guard because I wasn't sure. And I'm even still to this day kind of find myself hesitating mm-hmm. at certain movies. I'm trying to think of one that came up recently. I feel like it was an older movie, and and this is this is actually one that I want to get to that I should have watched by now. But this is a great example of what I'm talking about. You hear about how movies get banned, or they have you know that uh, it's this is one of the video nasties, like that whole nonsense. And of yeah. course, I've seen plenty of those, and it's like that's eh, not bad. Right. That's but I get I get where they're coming from in Britain. But some of these movies have this um, stigma about them. That you're just like, oh my God, you can't believe what you're going to see. So then I have this hesitation going in, and I'm just like, uh, what am I, what am I, what am I getting into? What am I getting into? And then I watch it, and I'm like, oh, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But I have it built up in my head. There's going to be something in there I've never seen before yep. that's going to gross me out. And I don't know. I just I, I get hesitant. Cannibal uh, Holocaust, I think, is the movie that I'm I'm thinking of that. I've wanted to watch. I've seen The Green Inferno, uh, but in the back of my head, I've got it. It's like, oh, man, I'm going to see something just completely gross. Even though I've watched The Human Centipede 2, I, what can be worse than that? That, that movie, yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 hmm. I can't watch that anymore. That movie made me gag, and that takes a lot. Yeah. That takes a lot for there, a film. There was one scene... Um, I don't want to know if I, I I know this is a horror podcast. I don't want to I don't want to describe it. But there was at least one scene in there that when it happened, I had to hit pause and I was like, I've got to go take a breath because I was like, I, I'm not, I don't want to throw up here. I'm I'm imagining that the scene that you are referring to might be the scene that I'm thinking of because there's Probably. there's one scene in that movie that is. I mean, there's a lot of disturbing scenes, but there's one scene that even I was like, I think they pushed it too far oh yeah that was no doubt the exact scene it was a step too far for me i was like why are we doing this and honestly like that's my only issue with horror films there seems to be this issue with studios wanting to just have shock value Mm. and a perfect example a movie that i have never seen and i really don't care to see is a serbian film i've i've heard about it i read the synopsis of it because i was like what's the big deal with this and Mm. after i read the synopsis i said i am never going to watch this movie i will i will tell you there's there's one movie it's called megan is missing i've heard about that movie has some shock value and uh if if you've never seen it you should check it out and any of the listeners should check it out you want to talk about a movie that has a really messed up twist at the end that movie is one of them, but I will admit the shock value of that actually works in the film's favor. And that's the so. smart way to go. I think that's something I was going to touch on when you were starting to bring it up is if you're just doing shock for shock's sake, it loses all meaning. If all you're trying to do is just see how, how many times you can just take it a step further in a movie like a Serbian film apparently does. It makes me angry just thinking about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just some of the shit that I've read about the mm-hmm. just it makes me angry. Anyway, I don't I don't want to get into it, but <laughs> if you're if you're doing something like the sparsity of gore in a horror movie, uh, say if you've you've went the entire movie with nothing big or gory, and then you have that one gory moment, I feel like it's more impactful because you're like, oh my God, I've not seen this throughout the entire movie. And now you're just like hitting me with all of this. And it's like, whoa. So there's, like you said, less is more. It's uh, It works if you know how to manage it. You do not have to have like this gory bloodbath. Like say the Saw movies. I love them. I love the narrative. But there are times when I'm watching it and just sitting there biting my knuckles going god why do we have to go this far you know <laughs> you, you you end up asking yourself how much budget did they have for fake blood at this point yeah it's it, that's my issue like i don't mind gore in a horror movie i don't you know mm-hmm. but there has to be a build-up to it i think the issue with some movies that have come out recently is that they rely too much on that they end up going how many brutal kills can we put in this movie you know how many people can can the killer you know completely destroy in a 10 minute period and it's and, crazy <laughs> yeah and I, th- I think if if that's the approach you're going with then you're missing the point of horror uh films in general because i feel like they're so hit and miss nowadays i feel that certain people who do get their films made don't 
understand or even have a proper love or passion for the genre. They just see a quick and easy way to make a buck and they're going to try to make their film. The ones that try to be funny or or they, they have this camp element to them, but it's all in the wrong ways. That It's like they're trying to emulate certain movies from the 80s. 70s, 80s, in that that realm where we know it it might be cheesy or campy, but everyone in the movie is taking it super seriously. It's just how it kind of came off in the, you know, end product. But then you've got these current filmmakers today. I was like, yeah, but see, that's how we got to do it. We got to make it campy. We got to make it. And it's like, no, you don't. You're missing the point. They didn't realize that's what they were making. (laughs) It just, that's how it just came out. You're trying to force that idea into something and then you're just you're making it lose all meaning it's not good if you're trying to make it something that it was never meant to be yeah that's the fun of those movies is you just find enjoyment and seeing how kitschy or cheesy they are but you you respect that they were trying it just that's the that's the the beauty of it you know that's another issue that i have is all these money grabs there are a lot Mm -hmm. of franchises from the 80s even the 70s that don't need to have a bunch of sequels they don't need to be remade time and time again and if you're going to remake a franchise that already exists or you're going to do a sequel take the time to make it good you know some films that works for that they that they've tried that for other films not so much i saw a quote the other day i I can't remember it right off the top of my head fully but the whole idea of the quote was that instead of remaking movies that did really well Maybe they should look at movies that didn't do well at the time because of the circumstances and remake those. Mm. That way, ideas that were maybe forgotten about can come back into the limelight and be made into something good. You know, stop running, stop running. You know, franchises that were good through the dirt. I- I'll give you an example because I-, I do want to do an episode about remakes and everything. But one movie that has had a bunch of remakes, one franchise that irritates me is Hellraiser. Yeah. They have made so many remakes to it, and they're not very good. Like that, in all honesty, and yeah. it kills me every time I see like there's another remake coming out. Fantastic! What are they going to mm. you know mess up this time? <laughs> and they've got two in the works now, if I understand it. I don't know if I think Hulu's getting one, and then another studio has one. I will say, but there are competing. Yeah. I, I I will say this though, um, they did do something interesting because uh, Pinhead from Hellraiser is you know. Very iconic. Uh, Mm -hmm. Doug Bradley played Pinhead. Um, Doug Bradley's not coming back to play Pinhead. But uh, one of the studios is deciding to go in a different direction. I think it's kind of interesting. They are going to have a woman play Pinhead. Which, honestly, I'm kind of down with simply because Doug Bradley was so iconic that it's like replacing Robert England as Freddy. You've got someone who's iconic playing that role and then the moment you see someone else in it, you're just like, uh, yeah, well, you, no. You, you know how I feel on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I feel that that's a smart move because then that way you take all the focus off of, well, we're just getting yet another guy trying to replicate Doug Bradley. Now, no, now you've got an actress who can make it her own because she's going to be a completely new interpretation to that character. Yeah. So, just shed all that and I, yeah i'm excited to see how they uh they go with that now another movie that worked really well and i don't want to talk about too many of these movies because i i honestly think we we're going to probably do another episode about this subject but i have to i have to shout yeah. this out real quick the way that they did the new candy man film mm-hmm. was beautifully done i'm sure you've seen it already i have not okay. matter of fact I will I'm, not sp- I'm still trying to get around to it i will not spoil it for you but they did I will say this much. They did find a way to link it to Tony Todd, which to me is wonderful because, again, when you think Candyman, you think Tony Todd. I mean, even when I watched the the old Willy Wonka movie and the guy in the candy store singing the Candyman, I'm just wondering, like, is Tony Todd going to pop up from somewhere? That would be hilarious. That would be a great (laughs) thing to do. But... (laughs) So your whole shift into horror, it was was a gradual thing, you would say. Just from a fascinating or fascination standpoint. There was just something about it that was drawing me in. Yeah. And 
I just, I didn't turn away from it no matter, because I could have easily at some point, like after the first jarring experience, I could have been like, I can't do this. I'll never watch horror movies again. But I, I, I stuck with it mm-hmm. because it was always calling back to me saying, hey, I know we had a moment, but you just got to give it time. Give it time, you know, and eventually it'll be fine. And yeah, gore nowadays, as we've kind of mentioned, it just depends on, it can get me to where yeah. I'm just kind of like, like that. But I'm, I'm used to it. I don't necessarily prefer it, but I can deal with it. Yeah. So it just really depends on how far they, they take it to where I'm, I'm kind of like I'm in or I'm out. But for the most part, I can, I can grip my teeth and just kind of watch it and be like, yeah, all right, all right, you, you got me there. But what about you? What, what got you into horror? Well, see, mine was actually, I can honestly say my whole um, start to loving horror was really a flip of a switch. Um, when, I was a, when I was a kid, I was terrified of everything. I was, I was scared of my own shadow. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was six when it happened for me. I uh, went out into our front room one night, and uh, for any of the younger audience, hopefully they know what a VHS player is. <laughs> if not, look it up. But um, we had a... Uh, we had a VHS player, and we had a bunch of VHSs, and one of them was one that uh, we had gotten from someone. They had just popped it in their, you know, VHS player, and they recorded some stuff because before there was all the streaming, you know, HBO and all that, you could just turn it on. It was really cheap to have it, and movies were on there, you know, uncensored. Mm-hmm. Well, this VHS had, I think, two movies, maybe three movies on it. I fast-forwarded past the first one. I think it was like, the first movie was like Gorillas in the Mist or something, you know, (laughs) some random movie. And I stopped when I saw a girl working on a house made out of popsicle Uh sticks. And that brings us to Nightmare on Elm Street 3. And uh, I stopped it, you know, to to Mm. start playing because I thought, you know, the house was cool. I was six years old. I thought the house looked cool that somebody built a house out of popsicle sticks. Well... At first, I sat there in, like, awe, but it was a shock kind of awe. You know, she's running with the little girl, and the little girl's like, you're hurting me. Put me down. And she looks down, and the little girl's a skeleton. Hmm. You know, so I'm sitting there, and I'm, like, sort of getting traumatized by it all. (laughs) But then Freddy comes on. And in part three, Freddy was sort of starting to do his one-liners and everything. He wasn't wasn't funny, though. Like, the the one-liners were really cynical. Hmm. And I just remember watching this, and, you know, this movie had all these different creative kills. You know, Freddy turns into a giant snake, tries to eat that girl. Fun fact, and this is very random, they had to film that scene from the side because when they tried to film it from above, Freddy looked like a giant penis. I've heard that. Yeah. (laughs) Fun fun little fact of the day. But I'm sitting there, and I'm watching this, and, you know, the one kid, you know, turns into a wizard. There's the kid that does the puppeteering. And, you know, Kincaid, one of my favorite characters, you know, Mm. he's cussing and... You know, you're, you're six years old. You hear you hear somebody cuss and you think yeah, it's hilarious. Like, Ooh. Yeah, and you know, you've got Freddy's skeleton coming back to life and and fighting, and it was just this whole concept was just so different to me because up until that point, I'd seen just regular slasher films or monster movies where it was way too serious. Like Nightmare mm-hmm. on Elm Street Three is a serious film. It is, but Freddy always toyed with his victims because they were in his world. He could do whatever he wanted right. to them. And that added, like, a fun vibe to it. Well, I ended up really becoming obsessed with Nightmare on Elm Street. And in the summertime, I would go stay with my uncle. And my uncle was the cool uncle. We'd go to the movies, you know, we'd, we'd go to the movie store and he'd be like, get whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And we would get all of these cheesy B-horror movies, you know, like Attack of the Giant Tomatoes. And, you know, it's just cheesy things that nobody's yeah. heard of. Um, I remember the first time we watched Killer Clowns from Outer Space, my uncle bought cotton candy and we're sitting there eating cotton candy while the clowns are putting the people in the cotton candy cocoons and i don't know what it was about it but after i saw nightmare on elm street 3 and i realized that yeah these are bad guys but they're not all that bad they're they're, they're kind of funny they, they they got a they got a different side to them um i just i really started to enjoy horror films at that point mm-hmm. and my obsession with nightmare on elm street we ended up renting all of the nightmare on elm street movies i watched all all of them. Uh, I tried to find bootleg versions of Freddy's Nightmares, and I watched it. Uh, my next big obsession turned into uh, Friday the 13th. I ended up watching all of those. The first one of those I, I, I had seen, I forgive me here because I cannot remember which one it is. I think it might be maybe New Blood. I could be wrong. It's the one yeah, where the girls, seven, got, yeah. the girls got psychic seven. powers. Mm-hmm. That's part seven. Yeah, that is the first one of those that I had seen. Mm-hmm. And um, I just... 
I ended up liking Jason a lot. Uh, I ended up getting a little scared again, and I hate to admit this, but it's it's something that I have to admit, but there's more of a realism to it. When yeah. Scream came out, the original Scream scared the ever-loving crap out of me. <laughs> because, you know, you were always so afraid that somebody was going to call you and watch your favorite scary movie. Mm. And, you know, that, that got me. I will admit that that got me. Um, and then Halloween. Halloween, I, I always loved Halloween. Michael Myers is a underappreciated slasher, I think, to a lot of people. The thing, I think so, yeah. The thing that I love about Michael Myers and that I think is creepy about him, he can be in your house right behind you, and you don't even know it. And he's a mm-hmm. six-foot whatever killing machine. And I'm still a little salty. In the first movie, the girl sends her dog out, and he kills her dog, and her dog's name's Lester. So <laughs> I'm a little salty about that one still. But, you know, my, my uncle um, kind of introduced me into more of the horror films. But after I watched Nightmare on Elm Street 3, I just fell in love with the movies. And then my dad and I, you know, we watched stuff like Tremors and Gremlins mm-hmm. and, and things like that. And I, I wouldn't technically consider Gremlins a horror movie. Yeah, see, I wasn't going to bring that one up, but that's definitely one of the first movies I ever saw in theaters. Mm-hmm. But it's so far removed in my brain. Yeah. Because that would have been 1984. I would have been four. I can barely remember it. Like, I have snippets in my head that I know that I went to the theater. But, and, you know, if if you're on that train that you want to classify Gremlins as horror. But, again, I'm like you. It, it has horror elements, but I don't think it's meant to be a horror film. It's more like a creature feature of sorts, I, would, I guess. I would probably make it. I, I would probably consider it. To be a horror comedy or a dark comedy, something dark like that. Dark comedy, yeah. I think dark comedy Maybe. would probably be more yeah. accurate. And I'll be honest, you know, I think it's funny. You sort of got into horror around the same time that I did age-wise, you know. Mm-hmm. it's And I think, I think that is a pivotal age for people. My sister is the exact opposite of me. I have to tell you this story because this story is epic. My sister wanted to watch The Exorcist. And she was a, teena- Ooh, boy. She was a teenager when she watched The Exorcist. My dad didn't want her watching it because he knew that it would freak her out because my sister scares easy. So they went over to her friend's house down in her family's basement. They were watching The Exorcist during a thunderstorm. Lightning struck one of the um, telephone poles near their house. And it was right at the scene where she, uh, I think it was the extended version on VHS where she does a spider walk down the stairs. She does a spider walk down the stairs right as she does a spider walk down the stairs. The VCR exploded and the power went out. (laughs) what yeah because the lightning struck and it, it i mean it sent enough of a surge through to make the vcr not like you know a full-on c4 big explosion but yeah the thing went boom holy shit <laughs> so my sister's not really a fan of horror movies anymore i can see why <laughs> i can see why but yeah i mean i i was about six like i said and even to this day i nightmare on elm street's my go-to mm. i have watched that movie i don't even know how many times <laughs> And I'm trying to keep up with some of the new horror films. Um, I finally watched, uh, is it Malignant? You were telling me about a while back. Mm -hmm. I finally watched it, and I enjoyed it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, I need to watch the new Scream. I haven't watched it yet. I know that it's a little divisive for some people because I've heard mixed. Like, the the critical reviews seem to be good, but audience reactions seem to be mixed. Some enjoy what they did, some don't. I personally had fun with it. Yeah. Well, I, I so, do know, spoiler alert, I do know that they killed off a long-time character. Mm-hmm. But in all honesty, I think for a film franchise to grow, sometimes you have to say goodbye to certain and characters. And to be honest with you, I'd, I'd been kind of, like, when, before this movie came out, I think we, uh, we had done, a, a, I don't know why my brain cannot think of the word, marathon. There we go. I found it. We did a marathon of Scream movies yeah. to try and prepare for it because it was like, I, I just want to kind of have a refresher or something like that before we watch it. Uh, I still, I won't get into my rankings of each, but by number four, I said, okay, I, I got where you're going. I see what you've done. But like you said, at some point, these three, if you're going to continue to bring them back, someone's going to have to die. They yeah. cannot continue to be the same survivors every single time so the fact that they even took one out i mean i i I give them a lot of credit for that because again they could have easily just let them survive but they didn't but you're talking about a sixth and you're talking about bringing the other two back and i'm I'm still on on that 
<laughs> you cannot continue to bring them back if if you're going to continue. I mean, I appreciate that they're surviving. I like them as characters, but don't bring them back if you're going to kill them just willy nilly. Yeah, and you know, I had at least I had read an article. I have before I forget this. I I had read an article. Somebody had said that uh, for for Scream Six, or if you know they decide to do another one, that mm-hmm. they should they, they should do an an ultimate twist. And somebody suggested that wouldn't it be insane if Sydney had a nervous breakdown or, you know, she lost her mind because of everything that's happened and got this like split personality where she was actually the killer. And I thought about that. I'm like, that would actually be kind of epic. I'm not going to lie. Well, depending on how they wrote it. Yeah. And they'd have to they'd have to make it fit all the right. Po- yeah, I'd, I'd be down with that. You know, it, it would definitely be different. You mm-hmm. know, I'm just, you know, with... With Nightmare on Elm Street, too, that's something... I watched them, obviously, in the wrong order because I watched the third one first. So Nancy died, you know, and and, and I'm like, who is this girl? You know, she apparently fought him before. And then I watched the first movie, mm-hmm. and I go, man, I'm really bummed that she died. But, I mean, I did yeah. it. And, you know, they, they actually did a comic line um, of... Um, the Nightmare on Elm Street stuff. And I believe in... Maybe not the, the main comics, but in one of the many, you know, ones that they've branched off and done they did a story where alice actually finally died fighting freddy and her son got her powers as the um she, you know she's like one of the dream masters yeah. and you know i thought that was kind of an interesting concept it kept the story moving along mm-hmm. you know you can only keep so many characters alive and do so much before people are like is this over <laughs> you know what sure, why, yeah. why is it the same stuff over and over and over and over again. And, you know, some some characters you just want to see go out and do crazy things. Mm. You know, you have characters that you want to see survive. You know, if if they made another 20 Evil Dead movies and Bruce Campbell was in them, I'd be okay with him surviving. Just because that's the, the, yeah. that's the atmosphere that Evil Dead has created. Sure. You know, Ash Williams is a epic character. You know, he's he's wonderful. And just to watch him, you know, use his chainsaw and his boomstick, I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, the same, yeah. it's the same reason that... When when people tell me Freddy versus Jason was a terrible movie, you know, I I look at those people and I go, you you realize that movie was only made because people wanted to watch them beat the ever loving crap out of yeah. each other, you know, and it you you don't take a movie so serious, you know, some movies you should take serious, other movies you go in and you're just like, I'm going to enjoy mm-hmm. myself. I think people maybe read into a few things too much, and I think that's I think that's why I like horror movies so much. You don't have to take everything so serious right. with them. And for me, I always go back to a um, Wes Craven quote, and I know I'm not going to quote it perfectly here, but the quote was basically saying that we don't, you know, we don't watch horror movies or we don't, you know, see horror movies to cause fear. We watch them to release it. You know, the the world is a scary enough place already on its own. So if I can go watch a movie where there's some monster that you know is not real chasing a bunch of teenagers who are trying to do the bangy bangy in the woods, I'm going to enjoy myself. Yeah. Sure. You know, I mean, there's something about it that's uh, comforting in a weird way for some of us. And I think if you don't like horror movies or you have some sort of reason to not like them, but then you you're trying to understand where we're coming from, you know, because I don't I wouldn't sit there and say they're for everybody. But so. but those of us who have embraced the genre, who have embraced the communities that go along with it, like. I'll be honest with you, as someone who is a gamer and a horror fan, horror fans are the best people in comparison to gamers. <laughs> and that's coming from this podcast uh, realm, I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I, I will honestly tell you on, on that note, a lot of people look at horror fans and they think that they're evil people because they, they like these movies about these things. You know, we go we go to uh, festivals all the time um, and, and film conventions and stuff like that. And you see you see horror fans and, you know, they're dressed up in costumes or they're tat they're tattooed all over their body. And they've got, you know, a tattoo of Freddy, Jason, Michael Myers, the, the Crypt Keeper on them. And, you know, you see these people and, you know, if that's not your world that you want to be in, you might find those people scary. But I'm going to tell you something. They are some of the nicest people in the world. We just went to a convention and we took the kids with mm-hmm. us. And, you know, our our little one was born just in December. And I remember walking by a booth and this gentleman who had a blue beard, a blue mustache, and I think lime green hair who was dressed in some kind of referee 
tuxedo looking thing. He gets up and he's all excited and he goes, wow, did you make that? <laughs> and I was confused. I didn't know what he was talking about. And he pointed at the baby and he was like, where can I get one of those? And I joked with the guy. I said, well, give me a few months and maybe we can work something out. And we had a, we had a good laugh about it. And yeah. everybody that we ran into, you know, they talked to the kids. They were wonderful to the kids. We had these wonderful creative people who made homemade costumes mm -hmm. who my, you know, my son was like, I want to take pictures with these people. And these people could have said no. Yeah. And he was afraid of a few of them, but he thought that they were really cool. And they they used their regular voices and they said, come on over, bud. We'll take a picture. It's no problem at all. You know, if they were mm. really that bad, they'd have scared the tar out of them. <laughs> right, right. But like like we said, I mean, there, there's something about the community. It's just so opposite of what, what these preconceived notions are. And there, there really shouldn't be preconceived notions just because you like something where it's primarily blood guts and gore and stuff like that doesn't mean we're bad people i mean i'll point to the mutant family on uh twitter that i like to interact with every time there's a new joe bob special uh the last drive-in on shutter when the new seasons start i've never been one to do chats on twitter it's just never been something i like to do because i'm just I'm an awkwardly social person at times, but with them, I can, you know, I can make the jokes. I can make a comment or, or whatever that is happening during the five hour span the show is on because we're all having, a, we're all watching the same movie. We're all having a good time and it's just, it's a lot of fun and no one is ever being hateful about your comments or, or your jokes. Everybody's just like, yeah, I like that. Or, oh yeah, that's cool. Or it's just it's a nice interaction with people that you don't know but you have this common interest and this common love for something and like i said with the gaming sphere there's just so much negativity but horror fans are just so pure i honestly feel that and i hope that there are some of our mutant fam out there right now listening because i want you to know you're so lovely you're so pure and i appreciate it you know i uh i had the honor of working at a haunted trail speaking of that and it was amazing seeing all of the people that walked through. There were strangers, people who had never met, walking together. You know, they, they knew that they were going to get scared, but they were fans of that kind mm. of thing. And these two these two people that just met, they were walking hand in hand. They were like, you know what? If we're going to get scared, we'll just get scared together. Forget it. And even when I would scare people, you know, yeah, you you, you get your, your oddball that's kind of rude when you scare them. You know, it, it happens. Yeah. But the majority of the people, you know, you'd scare them, and they'd just look at you, and they'd go... Nice job, man. I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> and I remember even going through haunted trails. And I remember this kid was uh, walking kind of behind us a, a little ways, but he got scared. And he buries his face in my back. And he's just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, it's no big deal, man. Like, I get yeah. it. It's fine. And we get to the end of the one haunt that we go to, and all the monsters are really laying into us. They have this amazing leather face. He's doing the high pitched screaming and everything. And like we're cornered, so we're like done screaming and panicking because at this point we just think it's super awesome. And the the guy that's Leatherface, he puts the chainsaw down. He you know, he he holds it down and he he clears his throat for a second. And he's got this super deep voice. He was just screaming high pitched as all get out, but he's got this super deep voice and he goes, What'd you guys think of the place? <laughs> and we're just telling him, like, this is wonderful. Like, this is awesome. And like we sat out of the haunt and talk to these people and you know they told us about their lives they told us how their kids love to come help mm -hmm. you know you know my son is you know seven and he loves all the all the horror stuff i don't i don't let him watch horror movies necessarily i'm kind of easing him into He's that better. which you know he, he knows who freddie is i dress up like freddie every year mm -hmm. and we pass out candy he, he he prefers to pass out candy than go trick-or-treating and he gets a big kick out of it and yeah. i honestly you know i think if something can bring people together like that it shouldn't matter if it's if it's blood guts and gore that's not real that's just on a screen and you reach over and you grab the arm of the guy next to you who you don't even know and he just kind of chuckles and goes that scared me too i don't see anything wrong no, with that it, there's something beautiful about it and i can't really explain why it's like that but it just i think it's and don't don't take offense anybody <laughs> I, I don't mean this in an offensive way but i i feel like i'm i'm driving to the point here i think it's because we all kind of find ourselves to be a bit um different awkward uh you know outcasts and then we find our our people within 
the horror community. Like these are people who share the same interests as us because one of my best friends in high school or in just like in school in general, that was one of the things we bonded over was a love for horror. Like he was big into it. Like he was huge. So much so that I remember him telling me that when The Walking Dead became a big thing on AMC and everybody just suddenly was like zombies everywhere. He told me point blank, he's like, you know, I really hate the zombies have become mainstream because I used to love it as this underground thing that no one ever talked about and it felt like my own thing that I could love and enjoy and now everybody's out there and I just feel like it diminishes what that is. Now, he was never hating on it. He still loved them, but he just felt like you you got people who love zombies long before The Walking Dead who really appreciated what the genre was and now everybody's just like hey look at zombies they're in everything and he just felt like it took away that specialness that zombies had at one time and I I, I can see that yeah I you mean, know they did the same thing with vampires not too yeah. long ago and I got so sick of seeing vampires everywhere that I just I didn't watch a lot of movies that looked good because of that I finally um, watched a TV series called The Strain mm-hmm. based off of, sort of that. based off of some books and they go off of a vampire that's called a Strigoi and these are not the handsome steal your girl vampires these are we have these jagged tongues with spikes that we stab into you and we put worms into your system that turn you into a mindless vampire creature who has no private parts they're like amphibians they have a a cloaca (laughs) and they're just these terrible disgusting monsters but i'm gonna tell you something i actually enjoyed it because it was something different they changed it up enough to make it different and i thought that that was unique you know as far as as far as the genre goes now i think they're still making a lot of progress with what they're doing Mm -hmm. but i do feel a little bit like there's this lack of creativity in it anymore which is just ridiculous you know i i think that there's a lot of creative people out there still and a lot of it's going over into the indie film side of things there's so many indie films that are just amazing and the studios that have all this money they can hire all these people they're they're doing the safe thing they're they're going we're gonna just do something it doesn't necessarily have to be good but as long as it makes money for the studio we'll be okay and don't get me you know I'm, i'm not saying that i'm not saying that that always happens at the studios but it seems like that's been happening a lot more often you know, it's it's just sure. like you you and I, we have been working on a script for a movie that we want to do, mm-hmm. and it's something different. And honestly, the the route that we will have to take will be the indie route. I'm I'm you know I'm sure of that. Maybe we sure. maybe we get some attention and it goes off from there. You never know. But I feel like that is the route to go. Or you know, a lot of people just get a hold of Netflix, and Netflix is like, yeah, bring it on over. We'll we'll make a project for you. Yeah. And I'd love to know how that works because I actually know a guy who had a meeting. I don't think it went the way he was hoping, <laughs> but he got a meeting. You know, I'd love a meeting with Netflix. Just be like, I've got all this stuff. Pick one. <laughs> you give me the money and I'll make it. Well, and that's just like uh, Squid Games. You know, the, yeah. the guy that created Squid Games, he got turned down by all kinds of studios. Same thing with Stranger Things. Stranger Things got turned down. Netflix got a hold of that stuff and... Now look at it. It's it's huge. And that's where a lot of filmmakers are going. And you see a lot of these Hollywood studios saying, well, that's not real movies. That's just through a streaming service. And I th- Well, I'll even I'll even give you one uh, as far as you're talking about studios, mm-hmm. one studio. I don't know if uh, you I'm sure you know who this or that you've heard of the studio, but I don't know if you'd agree with this or not. But one studio I've been keeping my eye on when it comes to horror, A24, yes. because they they continue to pump out some very unique stuff yeah and i think they were responsible for hereditary i believe uh, i believe so there's another studio called i think it's specter vision and that's uh elijah woods yes. and company yeah. that is a fantastic studio too yes. a- a24 just did that movie it's called x. x yeah i was about to say that yeah. and i and i saw somebody review that and they said it was it was the texas chainsaw massacre remake that we deserve and what someone yeah. said <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't tried to watch the Netflix movie. Don't I, do it. I I did it just because I had to I had to satisfy some morbid curiosity I had, knowing full well that I was going to be angry. Yeah. And boy, was I ever. You know, somebody made a good point. 
Le- Leatherface is is an amazing character, but without the family, it takes away from the the more sinister aspect of things. And I, I kind of understand well, that. Well, I don't... I feel like most of the filmmakers who make these Leatherface... And yeah, this is going to be an entirely other podcast. I'm just going to make it quick. Oh, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> the filmmakers who, who have done this, who have botched every single remake adaptation, which, you know, I'll give... Was it Blumhouse or no? It was Platinum Dunes. That was uh, Michael Bay's yes. take. I'd love to see what Blumhouse could do with it, but no, Michael Bay's production company, their remake and prequel. I'll at least say if there was two that I could say were halfway decent, it's those. Do they compare to the original? No, but at least they've. I felt like they were onto something more there than the other remakes and sequels and. Whatever they've tried to do, because it's always been like, well, we've got to hang on to the 1973. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can do something Move new. Along. Yeah, you can do something new yeah. and make it unique. You know, Because with this one, well, just with this one, it's been 50 years, man. Yeah. 50 years. The dude is old. And you expect him to be this... It just doesn't make it's any sense. killing machine. He, yeah. <laughs> they don't know who he is. They, it's like they had zero understanding of who Leatherface was. Sorry, this is a... That is a podcast all on its own. Just, <laughs> I, I, I do have to say something, though, because you brought Michael Bay up, and I, I don't try to spread hate, but I have, like, a love-hate thing with Michael Bay because yeah. when he does, when he, when he takes, like, kids' cartoons and he turns them into live-action movies, sometimes they're okay. Like, not all the time, but sometimes they're okay. He uh, should, one out of five. Yeah. One out of five. He should, he should leave horror alone, though. Like, he was responsible for the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. And, and Friday the 13th, mm-hmm. I think, too. And I have never mm-hmm. left the movie theater wanting to punch the first person I've seen any more than when I saw that movie. The only other movie that made me want to punch somebody was not a horror movie. It was the live-action mm-hmm. Dragon Ball Z movie. They <sighs> that is a whole other story, no. too. <laughs> <laughs> but Yeah, the... Nightmare. I, I know we could go on multiple episodes with all this stuff. Oh yeah, uh, the nightmare thing. There was a good idea in there that I felt like they botched. Yeah. I genuinely feel like they were onto something there for a moment, and I was like, oh, "Are we actually going to go this way? Are we going to do this in this movie?" And that that would have been the smarter move to go, in my opinion. They started with something that I thought if they if they did it right, it would have worked. And Jack Earl Haley, mm-hmm. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah. The problem that I had was. When you got deeper into the movie, it seemed really lazy. There was a lot of stuff from the original films that you're watching it and you're going, did they just, you know, copy and paste parts of the script? And the ending, the ending when she says, welcome to my world, bitch, or, you know, you're in my world, bitch, or whatever she says, and she cuts his throat open. It's the same thing that happened in Freddy vs. Jason, yeah. if you think about it's it. I same mean, guys that wrote it, yeah. too. And, <laughs> Like I said, like I said, and you said too, that, that that's a whole other episode. And I actually, I think I actually have that planned out. I, th- I think I think you and I have actually planned out some episodes about that stuff. But I guess the only the only thing really before we close out, because we've we've really discussed what we were planning to discuss today so mm-hmm. far. Um, just a just a general idea of you know you you've talked about what the horror genre means to you, but if you had to sum it up, what it means to you, you know what what it has meant to you, and what it will continue to mean to you as time progresses, what do you think you would say to someone if they asked you that? It's a genre that I'm protective of because it has brought me so much joy and comfort and ideas in some ways. Um, when I when I say protective, it's, it's one of those genres, like I don't go in watching every horror movie expecting to like it. I know, just like any other movie, there's going to be things that just don't gel with me. What I like may not be the same as what someone else likes. They may like these lesser films or movies that I consider lesser. They may look at the ones that I consider superior and say, no, that's garbage. Like you mentioned, I love Freddy versus Jason. There are a lot of people out there that don't. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, and that's your opinion. We can have this difference of opinion on how good or bad a horror movie is, and that varies. And that's the beauty of it. It can be, it, if through my eyes, a movie could be so terrible, but through another set of eyes, they could say this is pure gold. They can appreciate what it is. And I think that's the beautiful part of the genre is that there's so many good slash bad movies, but it's never the same for every fan. We can bond over a movie that we consider good, but there may be a movie somewhere down the road that we look at through the same set of eyes 
but we have two differing opinions. And it's just, but we can still agree to disagree, yeah. as they say. So, And there's nothing wrong with that. We're not going to hate each other because, ah, you, you love this movie that I hate and we could never talk again. It's just like, eh, no. I, I see what I'm trying to appreciate of it. And maybe I can get you to understand what I appreciate of it and vice versa. And I think that's that's beautiful. There are movies that I have not liked it before that after a rewatch I appreciate yeah for uh, uh, while we're even talking about Texas Chainsaw Part 2 the very first time I watched it I watched it directly after the first time I watched Texas Chainsaw 1 Mm -hmm. like I did a double you know double feature with both of them yeah these are two drastically different movies directed by the same guy but drastically different (laughs) tones yep so after watching what I considered this masterpiece of Texas Chainsaw and it was already kind of weirding me out I go into this dark comedy of sorts, and I'm like, "This is, I don't know how I feel about this." So I was, it was jarring to me. Yeah. But over time, I've grown to appreciate what that movie is on its own merits because it's not meant to be the same movie. But there are artistic choices that I understand now, and I feel that's why a lot of these movies give them. You know, if there's something kind of calling you back. Give it another chance. There's probably a reason something is resonating with you that's making you want to watch it again. If you don't want to watch it again ever, then you probably got all you're going to get out of the movie. Yeah. But, yeah, horror fans are just the best type of people. They We can we can love just the trashiest movie, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just we, we enjoy this stuff. We can make fun of it. But it's all in good fun, and that's that's what I love. There's there I rarely see hate in this genre. Yeah. Not not like this. Uh, like you can hate it, but it's never like I'm gonna eviscerate everyone around me because you like it and I don't. And again, I'm I'm coming from the gaming space. That's why I'm having these very vicious reactions because that's what happens. <laughs> oh yeah. You cannot have an opinion over there. If a a woman is a is the lead in a game, well, God forbid. You know, she she can't be homely looking. She's got to look a certain way. But yet in horror films, who are our leads nine times out of ten? A woman. And I prefer and them we that applaud way, them. actually. So. <laughs> yeah, they are our final girls, and we love them for who they are, no matter who they are. But, yeah, okay. Well, that, but, yeah, I love horror fans. I love horror films because it's just... For something that sounds like it would be negative, there's so much positive. Yeah. We all love each other despite that. Joe Bob even said it best in his uh, the last Christmas special they did. Mm-hmm. He talked about the community, and he was saying it doesn't matter what your uh, you know gender is, what your race is, what your political beliefs are, anything. You're all welcome here. You yeah. know, you're welcome here to enjoy this thing together this is our this is where we unite and that's what we need more of in this world horror fans are the most humane people <laughs> as crazy as it sounds yeah. yeah but we are we just we want you know this human experience yeah and it's i love it you know and and you you find your people here yeah so i hope that our people are listening and you understand that that's that's what we want to talk about here. We want to talk about this stuff, what we love. We want to hear your opinions on that stuff, you know. And maybe we could even talk about those if we get tweets or emails or stuff like that. Yeah. We could throw them out. I think that would be Everyone. awesome to do, actually. Yeah. I, I will say this. From, from my standpoint of horror and everything, I have always felt like it is one of the most underappreciated genres a lot of people even in hollywood look at it like it's a stepping stone you know this Mm. is the stepping stone type of film you're going to be in then you're going to move on to these other things but horror for me has always been so flexible in what it can do there are so many different genres you can fit even into a horror movie you know you can you can have Mm. romance in a horror movie you can have comedy in a horror movie you know thrillers draw you know all kinds of different things and it's it's that human experience like you said it gives us a way to experience something that we don't necessarily want to experience in real life obviously right but there's a beauty in that you know the the darker side of life makes you appreciate the good things you have in life you know you can go watch a horror movie and then realize you know at least i wasn't those people (laughs) (laughs) and i i think that's where a lot of us horror fans kind of relate with each other you know we realize that life can be difficult sometimes but to go and go and see these things happen in these films sometimes it's 
almost like free therapy. That's the best way I could put it. <laughs> it. You know, it gives you a breather, and you can go into a movie and have fun with it. You know, in any other mm-hmm. genre of movie, like like you talked about with games, you know, people are very picky. They they like to argue about things. Even with movies, you know, yeah. it, it seems like with every Marvel movie that comes out, or every DC movie, or any comedy, you know, there's people going, "This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen," and you know, this wasn't done right. And with those movies, people just fight. They they fight and they argue and they argue. You know, the last conversation I had with somebody about a horror movie, and I'll say this and I might get some hate for it. I didn't particularly care for the movie Drag Me to Hell. I thought it was a decent movie, not one of my favorites. I, mm-hmm. I love Sam Raimi, and there were a lot of things about the movie that I loved. There was just something about it to me was kind of off. And right. the person that I was talking to, they loved it. And they were like, you really didn't like it? I was like, it's not that I didn't like it. There was just, it didn't feel like it was for me. Like it felt like it was, right. it felt like it was trying to be Evil Dead. And I get, you know, Sam Raimi did Evil Dead, but it felt like it was trying to be Evil Dead in a weird way to me. And he was like, mm-hmm. and the guy that I was talking to, he was like, well, did you at least have, you know, fun with it? And I was like, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I thought was funny and everything. And we just left it at that. You know, there was no, yeah. well, why didn't you like it? You know, it was just a simple conversation. And, you know, there's a lot of movies that I like that are, that are crap to some people. You know, I, I have another buddy who does not like Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I like Killer Clowns from Outer Space because it's cheesy and it's yeah. funny. And he, you know, he just, he, he found things about the movie that he liked. You know, he was like, it's not really my cup of tea, but I will admit the clowns are pretty cool looking. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, people can take notes from that. Yeah. You know, you ex- you expect these people from the horror community to be vicious and monstrous. We're all just trying to get along and have a good time. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there's enough negativity in the world. We don't need it here. No. You, you know? know, and pe- pe- some people give me a hard time because um, I'll laugh. Sometimes when the killer catches someone, I'll laugh. And they're like, what are you laughing about? And I go, she ran upstairs when she should have ran out the front yeah. door. Like. I'm sorry, but that's kind of funny. Like, you know, I think the biggest thing I could say for horror fans is we don't take ourselves too seriously. And I think yeah. that's a note that a lot of people could take and live by, in mm-hmm. all honesty. But I hope the genre I hope the genre starts getting the attention that it deserves. You know, there was a time when it, it was really big, it was really popular. It's still popular, but mm. like horror was extremely mainstream not to, not too long ago. And then it yeah. kind of, you know, it kind of died off a little bit. And I see it happen all the time. But I, I really hope that it, you know, makes more of a comeback. I would love to see a horror movie. Some horror movies have won Oscars. Mm-hmm. I would love to. I would love to see a horror movie win Best Picture. Yeah, yeah, I, that I, would be amazing. I think. I think there are a lot of horror movies out there that that are worthy of winning Best Picture. I'd have to look because I'm, you know, maybe one has one, and I just. Don't have the information here in front of me, but in recent years, one hasn't won. I know the es- no. I know the Exorcist won an Oscar for uh, its effects back in yeah. the day. Did didn't? Uh, no, she may not have. I was wondering if if Ellen Burstyn was nom. She might have been nominated. I don't Maybe. think she won because I know she won an Oscar for Requiem for a Dream, and that might have been her first. So maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Could be. I don't, Could be. I don't know. But you know, it's just I miss. I miss, they used to have a thing called the Chainsaw Awards on TV. Yeah, yeah. And it was a night just for horror fans. And mm-hmm. I wish that that would come back. I wish that they would maybe look into making horror films. If they're going to do remakes, make it nostalgic, you know? Yeah. The movies that I have enjoyed remake-wise, like Star Wars, Jurassic World, they've paid homage to the originals. And I mm-hmm. think that is something that they should remember. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I hope the genre keeps doing well. And I hope, mm-hmm. I hope you know, people that are listening to this show, I, I hope they know that this is a safe space for horror fans to, you know, communicate with communicate with the larger community because there are so many people out there. And there are people that kind of hide the fact that they love horror movies and don't hide it. Embrace it. Yeah, love it. You know, for sure. it doesn't make you a bad person. If anything, it makes you a person who is better at adjusting to things mm-hmm. that, you know, they, they have statistically proven that people who watch horror movies are actually better at dealing with stressful situations. And I completely get that (laughs) yeah oh yeah i could see that and to to kind of piggyback off your point about the mainstream uh element of horror i kind of feel like where it's at now is where i'd like it to stay yeah i don't want it to be overly mainstream because i don't feel like studios when they get involved they don't quite understand what's making something tick true as far as horror movies go true when we've got a beautiful uh streaming site like shutter that curates you know plenty of horror content for everybody they know what the people are after they they give everything a shot 
not everything on there's gold, but hey, a lot of great original content. Yeah. Then you've got um, Blu-ray manufacturers like Arrow yeah. and Scream Factory. Scream Factory and Arrow both do amazing jobs yeah. preserving and really cleaning up you know the the films of the past when they put out these new restorations like i had never seen friday the 13th look as good as as marvelous as it did on that blu-ray release that they did with scream factory i was like oh my god (laughs) this looks phenomenal and it wasn't even 4k it just looked it was like oh like they took every like cleaned it up like i'd never seen before it just it was phenomenal same with with their uh, 4k release of halloween I mean, the, the sound, the image, everything's just so pristine, and they take the time to do that. I'm willing to pay the extra money if you're willing to put in the time and effort to make it presentable. Well, and I guess, I guess when I when I say mainstream, I guess more so the the point I was trying to make more so was I wish that horror films would maybe be rewarded a little more than they are. Right, right. You know, right. More, more along the lines of you know these are quality films whether you want to admit it or not they are quality films Mm -hmm. they deserve to at least have some attention paid to them like i think people's heads would spin if a horror movie won best picture (laughs) their heads their heads would spin you know and uh now i'm gonna piggyback on something you said speaking of you know all of these services that are doing everything there i'd I'd have to look up the uh um the streaming service but they just re-released freddy's nightmares it wasn't available hardly anywhere, no and they just re-released it. Like I'm about to sign up for another streaming service just to watch Freddy's Nightmares. <laughs> but I can you know, understand that. that shows you dedication there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, one thing that I will say: we go, you know, when when we go to the conventions, you see all of these uh, vendors, and you want to talk about dedication to a genre. The stuff that these people make is mm-hmm. phenomenal. There's this there's this guy that makes these 3D um, photos, and he puts lights in them. And he takes Goosebumps books and he adds horror movie characters to them. So he had a, he, one of the things he had was a Goosebumps Candyman picture. And it was it said Goosebumps up at the top. It had Tony Todd's face on it. And, you know, every Goosebumps book has the little quotes on it. The quote mm-hmm. was, be my victim. And they had nice. they had bees around the Goosebumps logo. And the Goosebumps logo looked like it was made out of honey. And, you know, the, the, time, the time that the guy put into it was just insane but the the dedication there is just wonderful you know these people find a craft yeah. and they find something they love and i think that's the big thing for me i feel like people really feel like they can be themselves mm. especially horror fans and when you go to a convention and and stuff you know people aren't ashamed to go there and just be them because they know nobody's gonna really you know un- unless you're like a complete jerk nobody's gonna care what you're doing you know people are just yeah. accepting and I think more so in this community than any community. And I, I hope that this community continues to grow and keeps creating all this beautiful content. And I hope that horror fans are able to get rid of that stigma that just because we like things that go bump in the night, that doesn't mean that we're bad people. Mm-hmm. So. And you, to even speaking to those uh, conventions, the people who are involved in the horror films, that that equally shows you how amazing the horror community is because even the actors, 90% of them are great people. Yes. I'm not going to speak to every one of them. Ironically enough, the one person I'm thinking of wasn't in a horror movie as we just discussed. <laughs> it was more of a dark comedy. Yeah. But he was an asshole. And I, I won't name drop him here yet, but I will over time. <laughs> but, you know. Anyway. I, I, will, I will name a couple people that were really sweet that we met. Uh, we met Tony Todd, Candyman. Mm-hmm wonderful man he even said because we took a picture with the kids he asked how old our youngest was and before we left it was funny she spit out her binky and before we left he said thank you for sharing your bundle of joy with me Uh and then when my wife picked up the binky he looked at her and he said i would probably sterilize that (laughs) (laughs) um kane hodder was fantastic um Mm -hmm. i've met uh matthew lillard he is i'd love to meet him he is wonderful my son was a little nervous to meet him, and uh, he he got down on his level. He did the shaggy voice, and then he signed he signed my lanyard. And when they go to those conventions, they have to pay the house a little bit of cash when they give autographs and stuff. He looked mm. he looked around, he signed it, and he said, "Don't tell anybody." And I'm like, "You don't got to worry about me telling anybody anything." And I fanboyed when I met Robert England, as Robert England is just phenomenal to me, and he he's so popular that he 
actually has tickets to even stand in line to get his signature. But that's not the only reason why they have to give out tickets. They give out tickets because he spends time talking to the fans. Yeah. And we had a fan ahead of us. He was a few spots ahead of us. And he brought something for Robert England to sign that Robert England had never gotten to sign for a fan before. And he actually had the guy turn around. He stood up and he was like, hey, everybody, this is such and such. I just wanted to say it's so freaking awesome. He brought these for me to sign and I've never signed these before. And then when we got up there, he saw my son mm -hmm. and his autographs were $100 a piece. I got an autograph from him. I, you know, I, I obviously paid for mine. And then um, we um, were sitting there and he grabbed a picture of uh, Scarecrow from, I think it's Injustice 2. He does Scarecrow's voice. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I never get to sign for the kids. And he signed it and he gave it to my son. And I went to go get money for him, and he was like, don't worry about it. Not a problem. And then, um, do you know who John Carroll Lynch is? Yes. So, mm -hmm. my wife loves him as Twisty in American Horror Story. We met him. He uh, remembered us the second day that we met him. He was like, I'm not very good at this. He's like, but you guys are from a small small place in Ohio, right? We were like, yeah. And he's like, and, and you two have the same name, my son and I. And we were like, yeah, you, you remembered more than... We thought you would. He gave us a free picture, and then he asked us what our social media tags were, and he tagged us on social media to say thank you for coming and getting pictures with him. That's cool. You know, there's a lot of celebrities you meet who won't give you the time of day, but these these people no. these people that play these really scary characters, they play these evil characters. They're they're just down to earth. They're they're so down to earth. It's unreal. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who's never met Kane Hodder, I'll point him out too. He's wonderful. And yeah. if you ever get the chance. I, I don't know if you've seen it. You probably have. There's a documentary about him. It's called To Hell and mm. Back, The Kane Hodder Story. The things that that man went through, it's amazing that he has a smile on his face as much as he does. Because right. he went through he went through hell just like the documentary says. He went through hell. But yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I just want the horror community to, to know that we're here. And I want them to know that this is our genre. Own it, everybody. Own it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't really have anything else. I think we've uh, we've introduced ourselves fairly well to everybody. I feel like we did. So, um, I guess I'll just tell the people. You know, they can check out the podcast on uh, pencilpaperproductions.com. We're going to be going through Anchor, and uh, we're going to probably be on Apple, iTunes, will probably be, Apple uh, Music. When you when you start looking for us, try to find us on Anchor, uh, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. I'm sure over time, as we know. We'll be out there in other platforms. But those are three of the bigger ones right now. Spotify, I know, is pretty popular. So you can at least find us on popular um, platforms in which podcasts are listened. And you can always find us on Twitter, too. Yes. Under the Horror, Ram Horror Ramblings podcast. Find us mm -hmm. there. But thanks for taking the time to listen to us, guys. We, uh, we appreciate it, and you'll be hearing more from us soon. Make sure you guys stay spooky out there. <laughs> This has been the Horror Ramblings Podcast. <laughs> Join us next time for even more horror. <laughs>